Sorry for the delay, it's just a problem with drivers because hey, Linux and open source software. Uh, I'm Cole Johnson, this is a hobby project of mine. It began a bit over a year ago. I did like minor work actually around two years ago and then really started doing it in uh, January. I think I'm the youngest one here. I'm not out of high school yet. <laughs> and I'm just doing this in my free time. So this is actually some of the last one where Emulating, uh, emulating integrated circuits from the 70s by analyzing the dyes and doing reverse electronic de design automation. So our goal is just create emulations of these systems which haven't been emulated yet. And the systems we're looking at are, discrete, are ones that use dedicated game chips buff, uh, after ones like the Magnavox Odyssey which used uh, which used discrete circuitry, just transistors and uh, TTL chips, and these were before uh, uh, Microprocessor-based systems like the Atari 2600 up here. So they had sp game chips designed specifically to play a certain number of games and you didn't have uh, replaceable cartridges and such. Here's some more examples. On the left is the Color TV Game 6, which is Nintendo's first console. That one, uh, I don't have die photos for yet, but I'm looking f that's what I'm really looking to. On the right, that re weirdly shaped one is the Clico Toaster Arcade, which is the Rolls Royce of Pong systems. And also probably one of the weirdest looking consoles ever and then a little screenshot from it. And so this has not been done before because it's not, stri not that straightforward. All the game logic is in a custom ASIC, like you see there. There's only a little bit of support circuitry outside of it, and they did this to make it super low cost. Um, there's no software interface. You can't uh, poke and peek registers and see what happens or go through a uh, book on the what uh, programmer's booklet. There's no ROMs or microprocessor to dump. So you can't have like an ISA and read it out. You don't have an ISA that you can emulate. And a lot of times these do not even have data sheets. So it's a challenge. And this is why it hasn't been done, even though people have been looking to it for uh, over a decade at least. So the only way we have to do this is to open them up and look inside. Uh, this is decapping chips. You need, uh, for epoxy ones, you need something like fuming nitric acid or other very nasty chemicals. And uh, you need specialized microscopes to take images of the dye, and then to get the necessary precision for reverse engineering, you need to take a ton of images and then stitch them together. And then there's just pick a, a picture, uh, Wiki Wikipedia picture of a dye uh, being a, a dye opened up, and then middle of microscope, and then the right is a chip I actually uh, tr just a random chip I tried decapping sometime two years ago. And the chip, uh, so here's an example chip. I'm running through it, and I'm going to repeat this process for other ones. It's the AY3500. It was designed by Gel Instruments. They did a lot of cable TV and stuff, and actually uh, their semiconductor division was spun off to microchip technology, which is also microsemi, which we would talk well, a little here, micro uh, semi stock and such. Uh, but it could just play seven different games. And by games, we mean slight div different variations of Pong and two games that you could play with a light gun. And they, they produce these in the millions. You can still buy them on eBay, and there's like a dozen YouTube videos of people who build systems out of them. Uh, and then there are over 200 different video game systems that use them because they sold this to anyone that could retail it. And then also, a uh, nice thing is we do have data sheets. This one makes it a little easier. Other chips, we don't have them. So this is the die photo of it opened up. And this is one I did not do. This is uh, someone named Sean Riddle who has done uh, uh, open up chips for emulation. And this is uh, very, this is about brown size of a grain of rice to chip on the die, it's the die surface. And you can see a few repeating structures in the metal on top. And on round is the, around are the pads which connected to the uh, pins on the outside. And then this tells us a lot about the chip. However, we do want to uh, get the metal layer out of the way so we can see more. So to do that, we put in acid for longer, which gives us this. And now we can see, uh, I'll, I'll zoom in closer eventually, but there's white areas, which are the polysilicon, which is the basis of the transistor. We also see the diffusion, which is another layer of interconnect, and the uh, avias, which if you, if you zoom in, you could be able to see them. So the first thing to do is figure out the pinouts of these chips. Like I said, we have the data sheets, so we have the external pinouts. If for some of the chips that we don't have the data sheets, then you have to uh, just reverse engineer them from the PCB and trace them and get an actual specimen. And then we can figure out two of these pins are special. 
in, uh, they have these two pins, red, one that have been, uh, these ones spread out through the entire chip. And we can see that because I'm uh, just using a paint program to trace these out. So one of these is the voltage source and one is uh, ground. And then, so we figure out where two of these pins are, and then this is a, just a generic uh, photo of an unrelated chip. We're showing the bond wires to attach it to the outside. Key thing about the bond wires, they do not cross. So if we know the location of two of the chips, uh, two of the pins, we can figure out the location of the rest of them like this. So now we've mapped out, mapped out the pins to the actual game pins, and uh, it just has a couple pins to select the game and various output pins, which combined form the TV circuitry. Okay, and I'm, I'm not the first person to do this. There have been a lot of people who have been... Actually, <laughs> sorry, I thought I was preparing for the wrong slide. Uh, here's the close-up pro uh, I promised. You can see the white areas are polysilicon that form transistors, and the brown areas are vias that connect the metal to uh, the diffusion underneath. And this is uh, basically you'd see in a textbook electronic swap describing a MOSFET just in, in reality. And we also confirm our, p our, pin, guess, our pin layout earlier because uh, if we looked at the previous image, this, this is the score, this is the image we're area we're looking at. This is a score field out pin and this is an input pin. This is a big driver, a big transistor to drive the current outside. And then this is a gate grounded NMOS, which is ESD protection. So we can confirm that this is an input pin and this is an output pin. But we, ha we have a pretty good look of the different components so we should be able to recreate its behavior. Now I'm not the first person to do that. You've had people uh, decapping uh, chips as a hobby and reverse engineering them for at least ten, uh, well for 10 years. And few before that. You have uh, various examples of Ken Sheriff, which I learned a lot of stuff on his blog. He reverse engineered various analog and digital chips. Uh, caps off, they do it, they work around the DRM of arcade chips. Uh, and then Sean Riddle, he also worked on reading out the ROMs from microcontrollers, because very early video, uh, video games use very early microcontrollers, which uh, did not have a ROM trace out function, so you have to look at it. And then the big project we're looking at, it's a Visual Stick 502 project. They did this around 2010. They, uh, they took the famous 6502, which was in so many computers and systems and such, and they decapped it, just like I said earlier, stitched image together, and then they processed it to make a virtual version of the chip, which is where they can step through individual half clock cycles and see the individual transistors turn on and off. And I kind of the idea that this could be repeated for video game chips. First thing I have to do is uh, highlight it. So I have a program identified the components and how they're connected. The thing is computer vision is pretty terrible. So well, we have to dumb it down for the computer by filling in these areas with solid color, which just takes a lot of manpower, but translates components to solid colors. And then here's for the entire chip. This is a chip I'm working on right now. And I did this in MT Paint, which is a GPL version of MS Paint. Uh, other people have done it in GIMP, which is an SVG pro uh, program vector base, but this is just kind of my preference and the way I wrote my tools to work with it. And then processed it. I created a program called Chip Tools, which I have still y yet to clean up and release. It's automatically, once you uh, do the solid colors, it automatically goes through them. It identifies what's connected based on location and connects components together and uh, identifies things such as pull-up transistors for if transistors are connected to voltage source. And it outputs uh, some JavaScript files describing the chip, which can plug into the Visual 6502 team si simulation, like SegDex, describes the geometry of all the segments. Transdex describes all the transistors in the chip, as well as what they're connected to, and then some information on naming them. And it also gives us a build report saying various statistics about the chip. So this is what we get. Actually, uh, I can open up real quickly. Not like Max. <laughs> okay. Here. 
here it is. Okay, so this is the simulation that you have. If we run it, we can zoom in and see uh, we, each of these uh, green areas is a single transistor, and we can see uh, signals propagating through this shift register here. And then this is the clock, just the code tells it to turn on and off, which uh, simulates an external clock and just advances the chip. And then this here is uh, a, t a simulated television output, which it just monitors the, p it monitors the virtual chip's pins and and it prints the output to the TV, so we have a virtual TV screen here, which you can see the play field and the two paddles on it. And then we can also, one thing we do is mess around with the score, because the score is in two uh, ripple counters, and we can actually update the score and force a change and then see what it does in the chip. And then, oh. Good, I didn't have to like, oh. Okay, so that's uh, just showing it working in uh, working real quickly. And anyone viewing this online, or you guys can find can find the simulation online and just run it in your browser. And then, so great thing is we can see the chip working. We can mess around with stuff. We can find errors since it's not perfect when you highlight it and kind of figure out where and correct them. And then we can also identify what components are based on what they are doing which we can read to reverse engineering. So the chip's based around four counters. Two of them track the horizontal position of the, or I mean the uh, horizontal and vertical position of the lechon gun, and the two of them track the ball position, and they constantly update at the same time, and the ball position counters either lag behind or jump ahead every once in a while, which causes the ball to slowly move left or right. And we also, uh, there's also the area of digital scoring, which takes about an eighth of an entire chip. I did write up on that and how that works. And that was actually a big selling point of the chip back then because 70s technology. So anyway, so the next thing you do is want to play it. So here's a comparison between the two, uh, two chips. Uh, well, my one chip on my computer, which uh, we'd be running in an H Gen Core i7. Uh, so the AY3500, about 2,000 transistors, 2 megahertz. It spends most of its time just updating two counters versus a um, much more modern chip. So we get a nice, speedy simulation speed of 0.1% real time. So this is where I started thinking about why it's so slow and how to improve and how to improve, make this faster. First thing's definitely language choice, as Fry shows you there. JavaScript is not built for speed, and it's even slower on these RISC V processors with no JIT. Uh, so the Visual 6502 team already did make a C version of their simulation. However, it was over 10 times as fast, which is still not enough to be actually play it even on your PC Master Race rigs, which can't play Pong on your PC Master Race rigs. And then, so I started thinking other things. Two, uh, second thing is interpretation. It, inter it interprets the net list, uh, which is, isn't as fast as a regular emulation, which contains all the behavior describing the chip in this actual code. And then a big, big thing is it simulates individual transistors, which is unnecessary. So I, start, I created this program from scratch, which is still very much a work in progress. It, it mostly works with one chip, it's called uh, Delete or Digital Logic Abstraction Emulation Tool. It just takes the, all these list of transistors and then identifies patterns in them automatically and converts them into a, a more complex components such as logic gates, flip-flops, shift registers, counters, and then it, uh, gives you Verilog and these nice little debug images which show you what the components are. So here's a little example of how it's working. This is a horizontal counter. It tracks the horizontal position of the electron gun. We can see it's a couple hundred transistors, which, and this would have to be updated two million times a second if we wanted to do a full speed simulation, which updating a few hundred transistor, a hundred transistors two million times a second is pretty expensive. So we can look at patterns and see that these up here are latches and then that these blue box, these blue uh, highlight areas are tiny little capacitors which are, functions that which are identical to type D flip-flops, at least when we take out uh, decay. And then the, uh, the, these lines down here function as NOR gates, and there's AND gates here. 
And then these latches, we can see these latches, the inputs, make them function only as type D flip-flops with asynchronous reset that are clocked opposite to the, these D flip, uh, type D flip-flops. So we've got these in pairs, which makes them into JK master-slave flip-flops. And we can also convert this, a lot, these logic down here into XORs and these into AND because a NOR is equal to an AND with inverted inputs. And these JK master flip-flops, we can see that they all share the same clock line and the same reset line. So we chain them together and get a shift register. So we get, so the computer would have a much easier time by now. We just have to shift stuff and then do a check against each of these AND and XOR, but we can simplify this even further. This shift register is uh, in linear feedback shift register because this XOR, it's a basically a binary counter which doesn't count in binary order, which the advantage of that is it takes up less die space when with 70s process technologies. So if we do, uh, if we measure where the XORs are and just do a little simulation in our processing code just with bit shifts, we get an LFSR that is at uh, zeros at state one, one, and zeros at state uh, two, and such. And, the, uh, and then what we do is we see each of these ands are matched up to the LFSR and figure out that, like, say, this and is triggered by zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one. In that case, we just run through the LFSR and, and see that state uh, 14. So we have an and which is triggered at state 14. And then, we complex, uh, do this, and we only, have to run, we only have to simulate it once in the processing program. We convert all of this into a counter, which uh, is clocked by a certain line. It is reset by a certain line, and has outputs at 13, 14, 22, et cetera. And that's fairly straightforward to convert into a couple lines of Verilog, and most of these are redundant anyway. So we went from a few hundred transistors to a couple lines of Verilog. And we repeat that for the entire chip, we go from 2,318 transistors to 319 components to 832 lines of Verilog. And there's, it, it could be made simpler, even better, but uh, a lot of the simplification will be done by the Verilog uh, build tools, so we don't need to optimize it that much. And then, here are the list of components. We can see I.O. port, it says I.O. ports. It has six counters, four uh, I talked about earlier, as well as uh, two my ones with square circuitry. These pink ones are ripple counters. Uh, the greens are flip-flops or latches. And then there's also four pulse circuits, which I'll talk about briefly, and then the shift register down here and multiplexers feeding it. So there's some obstacles. It's not straightforward. The main thing is uh, digital designers use a lot of weird, uh, very evil tricks they, uh, back in the 70s, which just you would not find in modern electronics. F big one is pulse on edge circuitry. This is a couple capacitors and inverters acting as a delay line, which is NORD for the original input. So it functions at, to create a pulse on the negative edge of this line, just a very short pulse, and that you just not find in modern electronics. There's also, it's there's no kind of central clock. It's asynchronous signals just propagate. You also have multiple input SR latches and level trigger to type D flip-flops. So we have to figure out a way to come around them. So we have plenty of resources on modern FPGAs and then can have much higher clock speeds to work with since this ran at two megahertz. So we can just use a faster clock to emulate the pulse circuits. So it's a cleanly clock design, but still does that pulse. And then build tools support complex latches, which mo works out mostly well. Now this is, not, this is actually synthesizable Verilog based on this flip, uh, latch. And uh, it's, it's not pretty. You would not find this kind of thing in any sort of modern design, but build tools can combine multiple uh, com uh, cells together to emulate this properly which allows us to, emulate, to recreate the behavior. And this put on physical hardware, put on the tiny FPGA board, actually some back there, it's uh, ICE-40. Thanks to Moore's Law and the fact that because this chip was maybe a, a state of the art in 1975, it barely used up any, it used up 2% of the cells, so we can cram so many on here. And then, uh, I wired up circuitry similar to the example schematics. It's just a couple uh, capacitors, resistors, and a uh, OR gate. And then here's the next uh, next BNR screenshot. And doing that, get this. <laughs> this is the Active TV. <laughs> 
Now, there's still stuff to work out, like those pulse circuits are necessary for the ball movement, so I haven't gotten the ball movement working yet, but otherwise, uh, but I should be able to get that soon. And then, uh, it's very, very accurate emulation, the real thing. There's the board, and then we also, it's in Verilog, we can hack it to make this uh, <laughs> slightly biased game. <laughs> And then so my future goals are to ver properly verilogify all the components so everything works and test them out. And verilogify is a real world, according to the Oxford Dictionary. <laughs> and then port it to the MISTER project. MISTER is hardware emulation. It's DE10 uh, nano board by Terasic and runs on a Cyclone 5 FPGA. And this people will just plug into their TV and play various uh, emulated stuff, uh, emulated FPGA emulated games on. And then uh, I also want to repeat it with other chips. This is one called AY38606, which uh, just showing it the process of it. And this is a screenshot generated from it only a couple weeks ago. And then there's another chip. I'm almost done with the highlighting. Actually worked on it a little today. And yeah. And then I well I had a I added a link up here, but it's not in this version. And my blog is here. Nerd stuff by cold.blogspot.com, and also have a Twitter, and uh, find the link for the source. Uh, source code is on here. It's on GitLab as well as a lot of the files involved. Now I haven't released all the tools yet because they do need to be cleaned up. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> Cole, cool. no words, mate. That was incredible. Oh my god, <laughs> just incredible. There will be many questions, I'm sure. Yeah, first of all, you're blowing my mind. That was pretty amazing. Second of all, uh, when I was 10 years old, I built one of these little systems with my dad. So very, uh, very fun for me to watch uh, how it all works. Now for the real question. Um, I'm curious about when you go from the paint stage to the simulator stage, mm -hmm. how do you do the error fixing? Like presumably you have transcription errors and so on. What's the process by which you go from a thing that doesn't put anything on the screen to one with, uh, with actual recognizable digits and so on? So first thing is I have uh, my processing programs will hi uh, highlight some obvious errors. Like if it says the transistor is unconnected, it will color it a different color in the debug image so I can go and fix it. And then I, do, I have to do the simulation because I'll see something that isn't working and kind of figure out, okay, uh, why is it doing that? Figure out what components are necessary to part and then trace the problems until I find something looking suspicious and then correct it. And then sometimes though, I'll have something like the let, the scorers look a little lopsided, being a, we, looking a little weird, uh, or some other uh, things, which I have to look at videos and see, oh, that actually was in the original hardware. <laughs> and then it just emulates and I think it's a bug at first. What's the smallest feature size that you think you could reverse engineer in this matter? Uh, well, there, there is actually a t uh, Russian team that's trying this with the PlayStation uh, 1 chips. And, well, the advantage is they're in standard cells. These were laid out by hand uh, because before standard cells came out. In standard cells, you can actually use computer vision to identify them. I don't think they've tried converting them to Verilog, but hey, maybe in 50 years people will be doing it with modern chips. But otherwise, it gets very hard uh, after mid 80s. Cool, thanks. Answering, answering Andrew's question, we did a 386 uh, that was uh, yeah. <laughs> when, when it was released. <laughs> Long ago, I was building an SOC on an FPGA, and I only had like 20 or 30 LUTs free, and I wanted to have a video display. <laughs> so I used LFSR counters that I decoded in the same way. And it's hilarious to see that that was actually how they did that. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. No, I, I think we're all still processing this, personally. Um. <laughs> People are just hungry. <laughs> Could be that. All right. Well, uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Cole. That yep. was really impressive. Thank you.